Well, hello and welcome to the premiere episode of the Viewfinders Photography Podcast, the show that takes you inside the minds of some of the world's best photographers. I'm your host, Graham Dargie, and it's great to have you along for this first episode. And I have to say, I'm really looking forward to this first season of the show. I've got an array of incredible guests from different genres of photography, each of whom give a really valuable insight into their thoughts and approach when they pick up the camera. Today's guest is Audrey Woolard. Audrey is a portrait photographer from Chicago, who's a Nikon ambassador and a Profoto legend of light. It's a real privilege to have Audrey on the first episode of the show, and she shared her story and her advice with incredible generosity. Our conversation covers everything from how Audrey got started in photography to how she developed her trademark style, how she worked with different personalities at a shoot, as well as business advice, and why she has six 85mm lenses in her camera bag. Wherever you're at on your photography journey, I'm sure you'll take a few things away from this episode. If you enjoy the show, let me invite you to subscribe, rate, and leave a kind review. That's the best way for you to help the podcast reach more listeners. I'd really appreciate it. I'd love to connect with you, the listener, and you can find me on social media and at the Viewfinders webpage. Okay, without further ado, here's my conversation with the amazing Audrey Woolard. Audrey, thanks for coming on. How's things? Um, thanks for having me. Things are pretty good. It's getting cold here. I'm in Chicago, but we're handling it. Mm-hmm. Is it really a windy city? It only in certain sections. So when you get around the tall buildings, then it's it's windy. If you're not in the tall buildings, then it's not. Okay, so you live in the suburbs or? I live in the suburbs. So I am about 30 minutes away from, you know, the, the city, even though I'm there all the time, but I'm about 30 minutes away. I'll ask you to introduce yourself and uh, tell me a bit about your photography. So my name is Audrey Bullard, and I am based out of Chicago, Illinois. The name of my business is Kids and the City. So I photograph um young kids, mostly um, teenagers um, and their families. And they love to be outside downtown in the city. So the name pretty much works um, together. So I've been in business for uh, 17 years. (laughs) So that really dates me. Um, Started as a children baby photographer. And then honestly, as my children grew, that's when I started to really change the aspect of my business. And here I am today. Okay, I was, when I reached out to you, I I let you know that I'd followed your blog a while ago, at least 10 years ago. And um, it was when, before social media, really, and and blogs were the way that photographers, suddenly every photographer had a blog, you know. Uh And um, so it was, well, the style, I think, was different at the time. Yeah. Um, But when I, I just rediscovered you a few weeks ago, I thought I recognized that name. Um, let me check that work out. And I realized your work had changed so much um, and grown so much. And I was really I w- was really pleased to see that um, and that you were still going and not knowing anything about you. I, I just thought, well, that, that work is so strong. I'm going to reach out to you for the show. We'll, we'll get into your photography, the way you do it and your style. We'll, we can come back to that later. But I was curious about your background. Um, did you grow up in Chicago? Um, yes. I Well, in the suburbs. Um, but I've been here for my entire life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so do you remember, was photography a part of your childhood? Was there always a camera in the household? Well, my dad used to take pictures, um, you know, of the family of all of us, but I, I was not the person who grew up loving photography. Um, I don't really remember taking any pictures <laughs> as a kid. Yeah. I remember posing you know, like when my dad pulled out his, you know, camera, because he would always buy like a new film camera. And um, I remember taking pictures for my dad, you know, just modeling, but um, as a little kid, you know what I mean? But Mm -hmm. uh, as I grew up, no, I never even, I never thought twice about a camera until my third child. No, yeah, my third child was born and he's now 19. So that's, that that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> so before photography, what were you doing career-wise? Um, I was a computer programmer. Okay, so it's a really different 
thing that you've gotten into. Usually what I've noticed is that the first child gets all the photographs. And by the time they get to the third child, the parents have run out of steam for taking photographs of the kids. But it's the other way around for you, I guess. Yes, because our younger three are each one year apart. So it was like we had three babies in the house at one time. So when my oldest was born, I was still, you know, well, we got married really, really young. And I was very career focused and I had a really, really good career at like 21 years old. So quitting my job at that point was not an option that, you know, that we could or even I never even wanted to do it. I just graduated. And so um, then we had we have a, a nice gap age wise in between our first and our second. So then when we decided to have a second child, I still was working and I had my at a re, I mean a really really good job and I was able to bring my baby uh, my second child to work with me so we had this big day, you know like daycare school where they you can they'll watch your babies for you so I would you know leave my office go down and see the baby and it started to um, make me sad leaving him I, I mean even though he was like right there I just didn't like to do it so I called my husband and I said, you know, I really want to, you know, stay home and be at home with my son. And he said, you know, he was like, cause he saw I was upset and I, and because I was upset, he said, okay, fine. So I ended up quitting and becoming a stay at home mom. And the other two babies kind of came right after that. <laughs> so we had them all a year apart. So the, the love of photography, you know, started when I quit, I actually got pregnant again. And that's kind of, and when he was born, that's when I started taking pictures, mostly because mm -hmm. I was, I was getting intellectually bored and my husband said, you know, maybe and he brought a camera home and said, maybe this will keep you busy. And mm -hmm. it went, that's where it started. Um, so, okay. So that was the initial spark with the, with the kids there. And so where did it go from there? Did other friends start to ask you to take pictures of their kids? So I, you know, having the three basically babies, um, they can keep you busy. And my sister-in-law, my brother's wife, um, she, her son was, is really the same age as my second. So I was always kind of with her. And uh, when she saw, you know, I was taking pictures. My pictures weren't good, by the way. Like, you know, photographers starting the day are really good. Mm -hmm. I was not that person. So she said that um, as I was taking pictures, she thought they were good. She introduced me to one of her friends and I took pictures of her baby. Then, you know, there was no Facebook or social media. We just had these forums, you know. Mm. So there's a forum for moms that were in my area. And I said, hey, you know, some people who were there, you know, take pictures of your kids. But I only did that about two or three times. And after that, um, I, something, I don't know, something told myself, like, why am I using the free time that I have to take pictures of other people's children and not be paid for it? I, it just didn't make sense. If I quit my job to be at home with my kids, only to leave my kids and not be with my kids and not be paid for it. So that's kind of how, I, that's really why I went into business. So from that moment where you thought, okay, I should be paid for this, how did you, how did it develop from there? So I'm, you know, just from my own schooling and things like that, I'm, I've always been business focused. Um, my husband owned his own business. So it was, I had a lot of, of, of and my dad, my gosh, um, I had a lot of, I guess, influence right in front of me. So I knew immediately that, you know, there's one thing to start your business and there's another thing to market it. Marketing is, you know, letting people know that you're here, that you exist and what you can do. Um, I went for the marketing part first. I probably didn't have all my pricing together and things like that. But my first goal was to let people know who I was, what I do, and more importantly, what it was like to work for me. Work, I'm sorry, work with me. Mm -hmm. And um, when they, and that last part, is so important really today um, is the experience. And so I used to take my babies and put them in a double, those double strollers. And I had this little 
pack the baby Bajoran, I think it was called, and mm -hmm. put one on my chest. And I went downtown Chicago, like the most expensive area. And I started networking with businesses that catered to children and told them who I was, um, gave them a business card. I used to just, you know, just really make friends. And that's how it really moved forward. I met one business and um, they, I ended up convincing them somehow to let me do mini sessions in the store. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do them in a way that reflected who I was as a photographer. So anyone who will look at my work, they know I like downtown, I like gritty, I like things that aren't so pretty, but I love putting kids in that area. So I found an alley, like an alleyway. Do you guys have that out there? Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah, and I would put the kids in, the, in, in an alley. So when the parents saw it, they're like, is that gonna be nice? Is that a good mm. picture? Because they think flowers and things like that. So um, the kids loved it. You know, they love being in places where they feel they shouldn't be. Mm. And when, they, when the parents saw the pictures, because all I cared about was expressions and light and posing, they loved the pictures. And my business really boomed from that. Mm. So how old are the, are the kids that you're photographing at that point, roughly? Those kids were, gosh, babies. And I would say the oldest probably was maybe five, six. So that um, business connection with the store, did that really help to get some people, uh, get you in front of some uh, customers? Absolutely. Because businesses, any business, regardless of where it is, they want their customers happy. And I provided a service that they can offer to their customers that would make their customers happy. Hmm. So um, my goal was to, it, what, what would be the easiest and quickest way, most efficient way to place myself and my business in front of as many people as I possibly can. I mean, you can only send out so many emails and post so many Facebook messages, you know, but because I was in front of people in person, it, 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 it created a different connection. Mm. And so, yes, it, it definitely helped. Mm. I think that's, you've hit on something really good there. I was speaking to someone the other day who was saying there's no point having a, a something like, if you, no point having a product if you don't have an audience, you know, mm -hmm. to sell it to. And um, I think you've gone about things in the right way. I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of us are, are creatively minded. We just want to take pictures and maybe not so good on that organization business side of things. And if I can give one, so one solid piece of advice that I've ever learned, that we typically think that if we tell our friends and family, that would help grow, you know, a business. And it could, you know, so I'm not, I'm not going to denounce that. But what I would say is that when you're working with a business, they have something to gain as well. And if you do what I like to call business to business marketing, which is my business with their business, we both have a mutually invested, um, you know, I guess, thing with it. When you're, mm -hmm. you know, with my friends and family, you know, they really don't have anything invested in mm -hmm. my business and it doesn't really do anything for them. So I'm a big proponent of doing um, business to business marketing, if you can, first and foremost. Hmm. And so when you were, do you remember in those days when you started shooting, um, how did you feel with the camera in your hand? Were you, did that come to you quite easily? You know, um, I, I still, the funny thing is that I still shoot in the same way where I don't, I don't let the gadgets and the settings and all of that take over. I try to use my brain and <laughs> my eyes a lot more and, and then change my settings based on that. But so it, it actually, it, it was a little easier for me then because I did not start with a DSLR. I started with a point and shoot. <laughs> and so with a point and shoot, you didn't have all of the, you know, extra settings that you can do. You kind of had to trust the camera. So I had to trick the camera a little bit by, you know, knowing light and do the exposure triangle and I'm not the exposure triangle, but the inverse square law light, which is very nerdy light language, mm -hmm. <laughs> but 
I had to really learn that. And even now with the most sophisticated cameras out there, I still, I don't use an in-camera meter. I just use my eyes and the inverse square Lara light. So I still photograph the same way. So it was easy for me, I guess. Okay. The, the inverse square law is the most, the worst thing to attempt to explain to everybody. Mm-hmm. And I always just try and I just sort of give an overview and say, look, it just, it just is just leave it at that. Okay. Just believe me. <laughs> um, Cause I find it really hard to explain, but it, it is okay. Double yeah. distance or quarter of the power. That's it. it Don't ask it... me anymore. <laughs> So, I agree. So, okay. So your style in those early days was very much uh, working with the natural light, as you've said, and n- your style today is quite different. So can you speak to that evolution of the style? So I, you know, when you started following me back in that, about 10 years ago, um, even before that, I was strictly natural light. So no um, reflectors or flashes or anything. I just used my surroundings to, um, I guess, give me any little extra lighting on the face to reflect, so like sidewalks and things like that. Um, as I, I got really good at it, <laughs> you know, and I found no reason to use any artificial light at all. It wasn't until one day um, and the, a company, a pro photo, approached me um, and said, you know, we really want to reach natural light photographers. Um, we think that our product would help. And they knew that I kind of was the natural light photographer that, you know, if Audrey's not doing it, then, you know, that that's kind of how it was. And so I said to them, I was like, well, sure, you know, I'll try it. They did. Um, so I, I started with, um, it's like the, it's their pro photo a one. So that's like a speed light. So the one that goes on the camera and the hot shoe, honestly, I didn't like it. Didn't like it. So I was really gracious. I was like, yeah, you know, it's, it's a, it's very well made, but I couldn't figure out how to incorporate it in my work and completely put it away for an entire year. Mm. And then the next year, um, they, I guess, they invited a bunch of photographers to Alaska and they, they brought us out to Alaska and they had an entire, like, I guess, think workshop. And these are all big name photographers like, from all over the world. So not just the U S and they, they had these different stations set up and they had people there to show us how they, you know, how we can use it. So shade, you know, different backgrounds. And I, and this one, this was for an entire week. It was a beautiful setup and I ignored all of it. I just couldn't, I couldn't figure out why I needed it because, you know, I was able to get good light without it. It wasn't until the last day. The last day was full sun. And we're, the, the area we, we were in, in my brain, I'm like, why would I use bright light and it's all of this gorgeous sun out here what's the point Mm -hmm. so for whatever reason I had a really good instructor (laughs) they I guess they knew I was like the one who was not interested I mean there were times I was just sitting on my phone they showed me that I could change how my light looked regardless of the time of day Mm -hmm. I was in and I was sold at that point and then I knew to get the results that I personally wanted, meaning I could I could change my highlights and my shadows whenever I wanted. I knew I had to take it off camera. It could never be on the camera mm. because I needed to change the direction of the light. When I figured that part out, I I never went back. Mm. So I've been using it since ever since. That must have really transformed how you work or how you approach a shoot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so now I'm able to, you know, I, if, if, I, if I want, if I do a lot of things, you know, at blue hour or when it's going to be nighttime, right before mm. nighttime, if I don't want to wait that long, I can fake it with lights. Mm. And I only have to use one. I only use one light. So I'm not a two, three, four light person because I'm still outside. I'm still combined. What I do now is I combine ambient light and flash, you know, and to, to get the look that I want. That's mm-hmm. that's pretty much it in a nutshell. 
Okay, and it's quite, I think you described it quite well, but when the, the penny drops about that, how you can combine the ambient and the flash, it, it opens up so many possibilities for your photography. Um, so I was wondering, so, okay, let's start to move towards shooting and gear and technique. Um, when you pick up the camera, I mean, do you, do you work with an, something in mind, with an end result in mind, or are you just kind of collaborating with the subject or are you just feeling it in the moment? How do you go about that? Um, you know, there's, I have what I like to say non-negotiables, meaning things that I have to have in my picture at all times. The first thing is I have to have depth. I have to have a lot of depth behind my subject. If I don't have that, I'm usually not taking the picture. So I'm always looking for some sort of trail a street, do you know something that a walkway that's behind my subject because I like to use white apertures. So that's first and foremost that I'm always looking for. And second is light. Anything else I don't care about. I don't even care what's in the background. You know, it can be people, you know, cars. Um, but as long as I have, you know, that depth and the light it has more of a, a filtered look. So, you know, that's just the, those are the two things and everything else kind of just happens really. Mm -hmm. And no, I don't collaborate with the subject at all. Okay. You just direct them and you take charge of the shoot. Yep. Good for you. So I, I'm going to ask you about that in a minute, but um, so what I love about your photography, first, it's just very striking visually and very colorful. I love the city environment. I'm, I'm right into the combining uh, flash and ambient. So I love those the sort of stylistic things about the photography, but um, the level of engagement in some of the photos is very, very high, you know, where the subject is just there in the shot. And I think we have the technical stuff, which we can talk about, but really the getting people on board and staying engaged with the shoot, I think is the hardest thing. And the, the most important thing probably with um, portrait photography. So um, yeah, let's, let's, come back to that let's go through the gear first and then we'll come to the people skills side of the shoot because you're balancing these two technical challenges that you've got with the camera gear and the people skills thing to kind of run the shoot and keep the level of engagement up so okay it's a bit of a quick fire round about your your camera stuff so what have you got a go-to camera lens combination um so I'm all Nikon. I mean I, I am a Nikon ambassador, but I was Nikon for since the beginning. So I've been shooting that forever. Um as, in terms of um go-to cameras, I now use mirrorless. So uh I, I have a Nikon Z6 and a Nikon Z7. And I could pick either one because they look alike. <laughs> so it depends on which one I grab first. Lately, I've been using the Z6 because I just um, added that to my bag. Um, and then my go-to lens really is my 85 millimeter 1.4. That is my baby. And I have, quite, it's funny though, I have about six of them, but because <laughs> <laughs> you never know if something's going to go wrong. But I have one that's my favorite that I've had uh, so I got it when my son was in seventh grade and now he's 19. So it's about 10 years old. I've never had it serviced, but it's like, it's my favorite one. So there's something about the 85 with portraits. It just looks right. Don't you think? Yes, because it gives you, um, enough, um, background compression that's nice and beautiful, but you're not so far away. Mm. It's like a really good, um, I guess, distance that you can have. And I also feel that it gives you a, a nice, um, it still gives you great compression if you move back further. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Kind of like mm -hmm. a net, just further away and I can get a more full body shot. But it's it's just a perfect lens. I, I just can't, I mean, I have lots of lenses, but nothing beats the way that the 85 looks. Mm. And so I think that that really speaks to what we're, one of the things I was getting to with the keeping people engaged, because you mentioned that the distance that you can stand mm -hmm. from the subject with that lens. It's just right. If you have a, say, a 50 millimeter lens, you've, I've found you have to stand quite close. It's a little uncomfortable for me. Exactly. Exactly. If you go to the 200, you're 
off in the distance. And you're so too far away. Of, okay, so that's really interesting. I think how um, how the choice of equipment can actually inform the the level of comfort in the shoot for for both the photographer and the subject. Um, so I see how the lens is really working for you. Is there anything about the mirrorless cameras that are really particularly good for your type of work or is it just the, the latest tool? You know, honestly, uh, so I've got a, in my bag, I've got a Nikon D8 800, Nikon D10, and a Nikon D850. And the world seems to love that 850. And I love it as well. However, um, with mirrorless and with a D850, just in case anyone is listening to this and thinks this, I love the electric viewfinder. It took me a minute to really get used to it. I mean, when I first got the Z7, I that electric viewfinder, it just, it really messed with my brain. Mm. But now it's, it's almost impossible for me not to have that feature. So the Nikon D850 also has it. Now the difference between mirrorless, in my opinion, and the 850, that lightweight. I the, it's such a lightweight camera that um, for someone like myself who uses a lot of wide apertures, that it's so easy to nail sharpness because you don't have all that extra weight that'll cause um, camera shake. So honestly, those are my two selling points. Um, you know, with it, I mean, it, it, it you know it is really good with low light, but so is you know some DSLRs as well. But the I can't beat the lightweight at all. Mm, I, I'm using an 810. I've used it for a long time, and I just don't need to upgrade that at the moment. But I've handled it, or as we call it, a Z7 over here, mm -hmm. uh, or you call it a Z7, and it's it's definitely different in the hand, isn't it? I mean, it's a smaller item, and it, it's, it takes a minute to get used to, as you said. But yeah. what I thought about it was the, you know, for our generation, if we can say that having a, a, a screen in the viewfinder is, is quite different. But for younger yeah. people, anyone younger than us, uh, they've only ever looked at a screen on a camera, do you know? So I just don't think it's yes. going to be a problem. I um, never thought of that. You're absolutely right. Because when I first started to use it, I, I couldn't use the camera because I wasn't used to seeing an LCD in my viewfinder. Yeah. So, But now I, it's almost impossible for me to shoot with a DSLR now. Mm. Well, um, if you you know people at Nikon, Nikon, you can ask them to send me one, and I'll be a, a very, very enthusiastic ambassador for that. Um, so, okay, I so, might tag you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I there's just, I don't, I was going to ask about the lens as well because there's some of, some of your pictures have a very particular look uh, with the background, and I think it's what you've been talking about. But is is the eighty five millimeter that gives you that? really delicious kind of out of focus background in those city shots? Um, 85, yes, definitely that coupled with my distance. So mm -hmm. like when I teach, people wonder how to get, you know, the, obviously the further away you are, the more in focus your background is going to be. The closer you are, the more out of focus. So I, you know, these days, just, I've just been doing it for so long, I kind of know exactly where I need to stand. Mm -hmm. And I, I, once I figured that out, my distance from my subject, coupled with using wide apertures, I can get that nice compression that people seem to like for whatever mm. reason. <laughs> and you're shooting it, are you shooting it wide open or a little um, bit in? I do a little bit in, and that's a crazy story all in itself, but that I usually shoot at an F1.6. One, uh, okay. I, I think I can imagine it's just easy, so easy to get it out of focus when it's at the widest, those very wide mm. apertures, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so the, the wider the aperture, the more faulty the lens can be. Um, I started using, I started using 1.6, honestly, was because when I bought a new camera way, way back with like Nikon D70, um, I dropped it and it broke on the aperture ring <laughs> and it was stuck at one six. And these days I feel I can't change it. Okay. So I was going to um, ask about how you're shooting it. You said that you don't really follow the exposure meter as such. So how, how are you using the camera in terms of the camera modes, focus modes and so on? Um, so I'm manual. I've been manual forever. Um, and uh, focus mode People ask me that question a lot. I usually have it on 
single, and I don't know what the equivalent is for Canon. I think it's, I don't know what it is. I think it's like El Servo, I think. Uh, um, yeah, it's one shot for Canon. Is it one shot? Okay. Mm. So, so one shot or single. And I don't put it on continuous because I don't like my shutter going off faster than, do you know what I mean? Like if you, if you snap the shutter mm -hmm. and then it, and then it snaps three or four times, I, I, that throws me off. So I leave it on single, single shot. And, um, so in terms of not using, in terms of not using the in-camera meter, and I'm thinking of a very simplistic way to explain it and quickly, I find that especially having so many camera bodies, they all meter differently. I, you know, I can have one camera and the meter will be too far to the right. Same camera, put the same lens on, it'll meter too far to the left. It, they're all different. So I personally have a little trick, and this is my own trick that I've used forever. And I teach it to people who ask me. If you don't ask me, I don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> but I set my camera's ISO to 400. Uh, now, that can be tweaked a little bit depending if I'm in some sort of a situation that's extremely bright. And I would say think um, if you're at a beach and it's full sun. So I might, you know, dial it down to a 200. But for the most part, um, 400. I already know my aperture is going to be at 1.6, right? From there, the only thing I have to worry about is my um, shutter. So when I get out there with even the smallest kid or an adult and I take a picture and it's too dark, I can just dial up or down my shutter. And that's the only thing I have to worry about hmm. unless I'm changing um, a completely different lighting situation. Then I would adjust my ISO. So some people say, well, why don't you just shoot aperture priority? Well, the reason I don't do that is because I lose control of my shutter. Mm -hmm. So I, that's my own little setup. But I find that having an ISO 400 gives me a nice range to play with, um, with my shutter. And I never buy a camera if my, I can't dial my shutter to an 8,000. So I need the, you know, the maximum that I can get. Some of the cameras go to 4,000. I find that I need it to go to eight so I can just dial back and forth. Mm. Okay. So between the high-ish ISO and the very wide aperture you've got no problems with shutter speed and in fact you're working at the faster end of things yes when you're working with the flashes the pro photo flashes and the mirrorless camera I don't know how the shutter sync is on the mirrorless are you limited with the shutter speed you can use with that or can you just work up to those fast shutter speeds so every um camera not camera brand every lighting um setup will it's different so with Profoto, I'm able to utilize high speed sync. So with you know for high speed sync, I can dial my shutter just like I'm using natural light. Now there are some lighting companies that um, only allow you to sync your shutter to a 200. Mm -hmm. That I could never work with with my style. I would have to be, in my opinion, indoors, or I would have to use a very narrow or high aperture. So mm -hmm. that high speed sync option allows me to shoot exactly how I, I shoot all the time mm, that's brilliant it's it really helps you're right that um having stuck at 200 or 250 or sometimes you can go higher than that with the nikon flash and the nikon body but um it, yeah you do end up working in a little corner of settings that is quite tight right and not necessarily the wide aperture because you know the light just floods in uh -huh. um okay and so um you you must be using an assistant, presumably, when you're using the off-camera flash as well. Do you always work with an assistant? Um, not all the time. Actually, I take my husband. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, normally, uh, just because of the light, it's really it's a really lightweight light. So I, it, depending on who I'm photographing, I usually kind of have a mom hold. You know, okay. it's it, yeah, it's it's like it it weighs about as much as because I usually use what's called um. Pro Photo B10, and it weighs about the same as like a 24 by 70 lens. It's a really lightweight light. So it has like a little handle, and you can kind of hold it like a, you know, like a gun or, you know, and they can just literally point it right at wherever I tell them to point it at. So usually I use a, a, the mom or a parent. I've even used other, if I'm photographing multiple teenagers, 
Um, mm-hmm. I've had one of the kids hold it. Mm-hmm. And if I, you know, I'm having a lazy moment, I'll set up a stand. But that's kind of rare mm-hmm. that I'll use a stand because I can't move as freely. Mm-hmm. So and then it blows over inevitably and then you have to replace mm-hmm. the flash, right? Exactly. Uh, it's really good to hear you talk about your technique because I think, um, I, I know for from my experience, you just find your ways of doing things, you know, and mm-hmm. you get someone to hold something and you'll use your camera and you're funny the way that you use it. Um, I think for a lot of people who are learning in photography, they can think everything has to be done in certain ways, but it's it's fine to find your own little groove in these ways, isn't it? Yes. I, I find that, um, that if when you're yourself, everything flows perfectly. If you try to fit inside of a box and do everything that the industry tells you to do, it will really um, stifle your creativity. Mm. So like you said, find your own way. Mm. Okay, I agree. So what I have noticed is working in a city location like the way you do, it's really has some challenges. Um, Can you talk about what some of the challenges are of working right in the city, like those, like some of your photographs, you're you're right in amongst the traffic. And um, so what can the challenges be for that? And what are the tips or tricks or little ways you found to make those things a little bit easier? So Chicago is a really big city. And um, I find that knowing where you're going to go helps. Like, you know, walking around and just picking places on a whim I find won't work because so many things are going on in the city. There can be some unsafe areas within the city. Um, So I have certain areas that I would go to when I'm dealing with, you know, traffic, it appears as if I'm alone, but I do have security and that's, you have to have um, a permit. So permission to shoot in those areas because it's just, it's too big. So what I do is I can send, I send an email for my week shoots over to the city and they'll make sure that they have police patrol. And oftentimes they're behind me and you just don't know it. Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't just run in the street. And yeah, take okay. <laughs> but you, well, you can do that here. You don't really need that kind of permission to shoot on the streets here. So um, it's just interesting to see that sort of cultural difference. Um so you must you might hear this a lot as well, but I, I know a lot of people are attracted to the idea of photographing people, but they can be intimidated about running the shoot, giving directions, how do I pose people and so on. Um, and I've noticed that your shots have a lot of connection, as we've said, and a lot of energy. And your subjects are teenagers as well who can be really self-conscious. So how do you just set that tone for the session um, where you can keep the energy up and keep people engaged and keep them doing what you need them to do without being intimidated by you as well? How do you just go about setting the overall tone for the shoot? So, you know, I think that people, you're, you'll you'll find photographers, if, if photographers really just take a step back and think about the people that they photograph, that they want to photograph, um, people are attracted to different personalities. And I have a a very upbeat kind of, I can be funny, at least I think I can be funny, um, (laughs) personality. And um, because that's really who I am as a person, I bring that into my shoot because that's just me. Um, I I like to talk to people. I like to, you know, talk about who they are, what they're doing. Like I could be in the middle of the shoot and I say, where did you get that shirt? Oh, you know, and we're just having regular conversation and I'm still taking pictures at the same time. Mm. Um, I often find, you know, silence can make people nervous. Mm. So I try not to have a lot of silence. Um, I try to talk to everybody that's there. I mean, I'm not overly talkative, but I am when I'm photographing. So, and I did, and that tends to keep people engaged. So when people talk about, you know, eye contact and things like that, I'm usually talking to them. And I don't necessarily have to be talking about you know, the picture that I'm taking, I, it can be anything. And I try to give a lot of really positive influence, especially with girls. Um, I always let them know that they're doing great. I I'm not very silent when I'm taking the picture, like, Oh, that's beautiful. You look great. That's perfect. And they need that reassurance, especially Mm. at that age. And does it feel weird to me to say it 
Yes. <laughs> but I know I need to provide that feedback so that they know that they're doing good. Mm. And so if you've got someone who's just very self-conscious or very nervous, does that, would you flex that how you're doing things a little bit or do you tune into that person's vibes a bit more? I do. I, you know, the, the shy people, at least in my experience, they, you know, they don't like a lot of loud talking. Um, they don't like, they don't like a lot of people looking at them. Um, I have had to have parents, you know, leave because the, the shy child feels they have to perform. And um, I, I it, it'll just be me and them. I, I've so, I mean, I probably can think of maybe in my entire career, maybe twice where I didn't connect with someone. Mm-hmm. And usually the, I, I can remember one time really specifically, um, they didn't want to be there, it had nothing to do with me, but they didn't want to be there. So I do talk to parents, um, that aren't referrals or that I haven't met, you know, don't force them to come because it's going to show. And I'm not a magician. <laughs> so and I'm, I'm, I'm really, really, really upfront. And I, I tell, you know, I'm rambling now at this point, but I tell people, you know, I'm very vocal. So don't worry if something is looks bad or looks wrong, I will tell you. So, you know, you've got some kids who are so shy and they're, they're wondering, if their hair is looking good and they won't say it out loud. So, you know, I'll, I listen really well when they say things, they might say, Oh, I really don't like how my hair looks. So that tells me I need to keep that as my focus. Mm -hmm. And I say those things. So I try to be really observant. I think that has a lot to do with the fact that I'm a computer programmer because we have to notice so many little things. Okay. And I bring that into my pictures. Mm. So between that attention to detail and just you're naturally, obviously, you're quite a good people person and you bring that upbeat vibe to the shoot. I think that's really helping. It really shows in your work. Um, Thank you. Sometimes asking the parents to leave must be the best thing that you can do because they can sometimes they can be a, a distraction, let me say, or intimidating for the kids at worst. Have, have you found that a few times? Um. Yes. So. You know, with during my baby days and young kid days, and me being a parent myself, um, I try to have two two clients. I've got my kids and I've got the parent, and I talk to them both differently. They're never seen as a unit. And with the younger, when they're younger, parents they just want to help. They don't want to be the helpless parent, and they're throwing their kids off on you, and they're saying, yeah, "Good day." Um, and I understand that as a mom. So I, you know, tell them like, you know what? They see you all the time. They're always going to look at you. We want their smiles to be towards me. Why don't you go have a seat? I try to explain it to them like a parent and not like a photographer. Mm-hmm. And that's always great. Now, teenagers, um, you know, it's a little easier to kind of, you know, get the parents out of there. Uh, but I say, you're making them nervous, you know, mm. just go. And they'll usually walk away because anyone who has a teenager, they know that their teenagers told them to get out more than once. So mm. <laughs> they're used to it. So would you, the, 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 the kids in the shoot probably might have one level of expectation and the parents might have a different level of expectation for the kind of pictures that they would like to have. Uh-huh. Um, are you shooting those two different expectations in the shoot or... Where do you draw that line? I, I do them both. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some these days with um, social media, so the Snapchat and the Instagram, um, the, the kids don't always want the pictures we as adults like. They want to showcase the experience. The parents want to showcase what their kids look like. So I, and sometimes the experience, they're doing just something really stupid, mm-hmm. <laughs> do you know? And just, I, I would never put it on my website. So I take those pictures and I tell the mom, I said, this is going to happen. You need to let them do it. Mm-hmm. You need to let them make silly faces and the duck faces and throw up the peace sign and all of those things. And I say, I'll just give them to you. You can have them. <laughs> I mean, what do I want to do? What I need them for? But what it does for me, those kids, because these 11, 12, 13 year olds have social media, 
they take those pictures and they post them on their social media accounts. Mm -hmm. Now, while the expressions are not the best, technically they still look good. So that's what I have to keep in mind is I have Mm -hmm. to make sure that the technical aspect looks good. If they're making a silly face, then they're sticking their tongue out. You know how the kids are these days. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't care. (laughs) As if we wouldn't have done that. Um, you're, so, you're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> I I feel really encouraged because I'm the things you're saying are, are really the things that I've always thought about photographing kids and parents will can be they want to get a nice picture of the kids obviously but the kid wants to stick their tongue out you have to just let them do it and get through that and get to the night get to the nice pictures after that right no um, absolutely I even did a interview um recently about parents doing their own school pictures because of the pandemic. Mm. And um, they wanted some of my tips. And I said, you know, as speaking as a parent that I understand we want our kids to perform, sit there, let me get the picture. It won't take that long. Mm. As a photographer, I know it doesn't work out that way. So mm. one of the tips I said, you know, if you've got a five-year-old and you want them to sit in a chair, but they want to run around, let them run around, make it mm. a game. Say, run around the chair three times and then sit. And when they sit, get the picture. Mm. And they have to incorporate that personality of the kid and their expectations as a photographer have to marry the two. Mm. Um, You've given so much good advice, Audrey. I'm really grateful for your generosity with how you shoot and how you go about those things. Um, I just want to ask, what's the future looking like for you? Things are, it's a strange and uncertain world at the moment. What's on your radar for the sort of short and medium term, if that's, if it's even possible to know that in 2020? You know, um, this is going to sound really strange. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time, you know, full time, full time, where I'm pushing on 20 years. And um, I've, I've had a really, really good career. And everything is going really good, but I'm thinking of retirement. Mm. And I really want, I don't want to be like the really old photographer <laughs> <laughs> running after kids and, um, I'm, I'm pushing towards retirement really at this point. Mm. Um, I think I would always teach in some way, shape or form, um, do some personal work, but for the future, I'm thinking a good five to six years, I'm going to retire as a professional photographer. Okay. Wow. I, I see you've got the virtual photography conference coming up. Is that something you're organizing yourself? So yes, yeah, so the virtual photography conference, um, can be seen obviously worldwide because it's virtual uh, but uh i i've got help my husband because he works in the business as well um it's our it's our little baby uh, it was not planned uh because i'm actually really busy on the photography side right now mm-hmm. but um but yeah that is something that we're doing our second one so that will be november 30th through the first of december okay. and um but yeah so would you see yourself doing more along the lines of those kind of events and tuition workshops kind of thing in the five, six years? Um, yeah. So what I, so my short term envision, obviously I'm going to, I, I, I'm going to still be taking pictures, you know, for my portrait business, but as that starts to wind down, um, I will still do, you know, like personal workshops, um, and I would still travel because I've done Australia, I've done the UK a couple of times and um, I will still do those small ones. Um, and I would still do some, you know, photography with Nikon, obviously. Um, so photography will still be there, but having the physical studio and things like that, I'm I'm going to start. I mean, I've, I'll, I'm, that'll be 25 years. Mm. So, yeah, I think I think photographers should think as a business, think long term and we deserve a proper retirement. Mm. Thank you. I do deserve that. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, I've got a special round now. And this round, I, I, I need your creative advice and input on this because um, I'm going to choose a photo of yours to, to ask you about and you can tell me about the story behind it. And I don't know if there's a shot of yours that has got a particularly memorable or funny or epic story behind it that you can talk about as well. And I was considering calling this round double exposure. Ah, I like it. But Yeah, you like it? I do. Oh, okay, well, we might still go with that. So um, <laughs> for me, I'm looking through your feed and your website and um, there's, a, there's a few shots like this. I think it's a it's sort of a signature shot of yours, but where there's a group of kids, a group of girls, and they're in a line, just uh, straight in front of the camera, but they have so much 
life and good vibes about them. And then the background falls off to this beautiful soft background traffic is around. Can you yeah. tell me a little bit about those kind of shots? Um, so it's funny. Every time people talk about my work, I'm always like, okay, well, what are they going to choose? And do I feel any personal connection to it? And it's funny you pick that because if I have done anything in this industry, I think I'm the one that made that shot popular mm. <laughs> is that one. <laughs> that kind of came, um, it, it came, it came from so many different thought processes that the technical aspect and the posing emotional connection type of thing. So from just from a really quick technical perspective, if I'm photographing at one six, I have to have everyone on the same plane mm -hmm. in order to get them in focus. So let's get that all out of the way. When I'm photographing kids that are friends, um, they like to kind of hang on to each other and, you know, have a little bit of fun and to sh you know, showcase that experience. I married both of those together to get my love of the technical aspect. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And and really um, uh, um, get three shots in one. So obviously I've got the depth behind them too, with the posing and everyone laughing together. But let's say I want to have th um, a group shot, but everyone has in their own individual look, like I would do a solo shot. So when you have them all together and no one's smiling, if you notice in the shot, they're all positioned in different ways. And that's really like their own like solo shot with the person. Hmm. Does that make sense at all? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, so, so I've seen people redo it and when they're when they they have kids holding hands and they, they try to mimic it, but I've never really verbally explained why I do that. And I, they some of them have to be faced in a different way so that it can be their they they have their own look, their own individual you know style with in a group of like 10 mm. kids and that's the best way i was able to do it mm. and so are you something i do at the beginning of a shoot a uh, portrait shoot I, i'll be watching people's body language uh, and trying to take cues from what they're naturally doing you know if they have naturally just put their hand in their pocket do you, is that the kind of thing you do for that kind of shot um yes so i take two things into account yeah body language i do that a lot with the littles so the little kids, I, I always do that. With the mm -hmm. older ones, I look at personality. And in a group of five, six, ten kids, everyone has their own place within the group. If you watch it close enough, there's always a shy one. There's always a very extroverted one. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I typically flip it. So let's say I have the more introverted one. I'll place them in the middle. Because they I, they need to have that spotlight just for that mm -hmm. one shot. Take and the, the export maybe of the peers as well too. Exactly. So I typically flip it around because sometimes the more um, uh, extroverted one can take over the shot, mm -hmm. and so I'll put them off on the side because they're going to stick out anyway. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, I look at personalities and um, and I pose that that make I create that body language based on that personality that I see. Hmm. And so for you, is there a particular shot that you can talk about that is just memorable, a great moment, a great experience, uh, or just a moment that took yeah. it to a different place? I'm not sure if it's on my Instagram, but there is a, there is a group shot. Um, it's of four girls. And they, the funny thing is that the, the session was over and after the session, they were taking, you know, their uh, their pictures on their cell phones. It is on mine. Okay. So they were taking pictures of their cell phones. And then the mom was taking a picture with her cell phone. So I'm getting ready to pack up and, you know, leave. And I'm like, wow, I like that energy. So they were actually in a position that I'd never really, like, location in the street that I don't like to shoot at. But it turned out that I wanted that expression. They're like leaning and laughing. They've got phones like in their back pocket, things that I would normally fix and take out. Hair was blowing all over the place, but their smiles were perfect because they were natural and they were having fun. And I, I, that's one of my favorite shots, actually. Mm. Yeah, it was on my website for like the cover for a long time. So they're all sort of scrunched together. Um, there's a girl that 
New York jersey or something like that on a girl with a what we call a body warmer I don't know what you call that jacket over there yes sort of have an iron like a girder kind of bridge in the background over yeah the and it was really cold that day so if you notice like you said one girl had on the the body warmer because it was cold but we were taking pictures and they they took their coats off so we can get the picture put the coats back on but it was such an impromptu shot I just took it that's why mm. it looks like everyone is in a different mm. season <laughs> But it's a great um, lesson that it's not just about getting everything just so sometimes, isn't it? It's just capturing mm-hmm. the vibes and the energy of it, especially with young people, you know? Um, yeah. And that was a natural light shot because I had everything put away. And I just cared mostly about the expression and getting everything, you know, this is what I want right here. Hmm. So, so yeah, I love that shot. Okay. Special round. It's a quick fire round with, and we're nearly at the end, Audrey. You might be glad to know this, but um, oh, I'm okay. fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought you remember film cameras, and I was thinking about calling this round motor drive because okay. you know, it moves quickly. I suppose yeah. that's the idea. Yeah, but I like it. The, the modern equivalent is continuous high speed shutter release, and that, I don't think that sounds as good. No, no. So let's try a bit of, <laughs> try the motor drive. Okay, 10 or 11 quick fire questions here. Wide angle or telephoto? Telephoto. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Head or heart? Ooh. Head. Mm, I thought you might say that because from the beginning, you seemed so switched on about the business side of things. I thought she's going to go with head. (laughs) That was a a toughie. That was a toughie. Yeah, maybe a bit of both, eh? Um, what was the last great um, book, movie, series, or album you listened, saw, watched, consumed? Um, I don't have time to read many books these days. Um, m- movie, I would say um, it was like a docu-series. And this is going to be really, really strange. Um, and I know this is a quick fire, but it's called The Last Dance. And it's about Michael Jordan. <laughs> the basketball player Mm -hmm. and how he went through, you know, his, he won all his championships and I just like the mentality. So the last dance. Okay. So are you like a Chicago Bulls fan? No, (laughs) I'm not really really a sports person, even though I've got all, you know, boys, I just love the analytical part of how his brain worked. Mm. And, you know, and I can incorporate a lot in that to my business. Mm. It's always good to see an insight into these high level operators, whatever field. They're right. In. Yes. OK. Expensive lens cloth or just the corner of your shirt? Corner of my shirt. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I always take the lens cloth, but I always use my shirt. OK. Uh, what's a weird thing I could find in your camera bag apart from six 85 millimeter lenses? Besides that, I'm like looking a weird, weird thing. Um, lip gloss. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that might be weird in my camera bag, but not so much in yours. Um, who's your favorite photographer right now? My favorite photographer, Dixie Dixon. Okay. Yeah, she's a very much fashion right now. I just love her work. Hmm. Something you wish you'd known five years ago. Um, I don't even know if I still practice it, but I wish that I knew um, how much influence I had. Hmm. Okay, I think we could dig into that, but we're way over time. We might do that in a future episode. Um, sure. One uh, photography thing you bought, you thought it was a good idea, but you've never used it. Oh my gosh, I can tell you that right now because I'm forcing myself at this point, a fuzzy camera strap okay like literally just to show you this <laughs> <laughs> it's fuzzy but you just use the normal one i just use the one that comes with the camera but i wanted one a nice little fancy one and i paid a lot of money for that <laughs> okay oh well never mind and <laughs> when do you feel at peace with the universe um when i'm with my family okay and so you've got have you got four boys is that right i have four boys yeah and they're grown up now? They're all grown up. So then it, it, my oldest is 27. Wow. And then my second will be 21 um, in a couple of days. Then 19 and our youngest is 18. So you're, we're in different phases of parenthood. So 
Um, yes. So you've got the kids are up, you're thinking about retiring. It sounds like life is going quite well for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay, so where can people go to connect with you, support your work, or find out more about what you're doing? Sure. My website is um, K A T C Teens. Dot com. My Instagram is Kids and the City. Um, on Facebook, you can join my um, Facebook group for photographers, which is AW Teaches. And then I've got a, a website where I teach photographers, and that's awteaches.com. Okay, great. I'll put the links to that below the show. And I'll thank you very much, Audrey, for your time and your very generous advice. It's been excellent. Really good to connect with you. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for listening to the first episode of the show. I hope you took something away from that. Follow Audrey on Instagram and Facebook. All the links she mentioned are in the show notes. You can connect with me at the Viewfinders webpage, where you can get my free ebook, Three Steps to Better Photographs. Again, links are in the show notes. If you enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe and leave a kind review. It really makes a difference, especially in these early days of the show. And if you're a new listener, why not check out some other episodes? Enjoy photography. Be kind. I'll see you out there.